Hello everyone. This is the first of two talks on realism. Realism is one of the paradigms of international relations for many, many decades, and certainly for most of the Cold War, it was the leading paradigm. What do we mean by the term paradigm? A paradigm is a set of assumptions about the world and the nature of theory that creates the framework for individual theories and propositions. It's commonly said that paradigms can't be tested, that rather they represent bets that a particular approach to the subject will be more fruitful than others. By contrast, theories and propositions can be evaluated. Uh, I'm a bit wary of this distinction, and this is a question I'll subsequently return to, because I think we can evaluate paradigms as well. Uh, it's one of the reasons that paradigms change over time, that we become dissatisfied with them, and we begin to think that some of their assumptions don't fit very well with the subject that we study. But this is a gradual process. Uh, it's one that arises by consensus rather than any kind of proof or formal evaluation, which is focused instead on individual theories and propositions. Now, the Riddler's paradigm has a set of assumptions about the world of international politics and how it should be studied. These assumptions um, are shared to a great degree by scholars who operate and do their research within the paradigm. Uh, this said, there are significant differences about how they evaluate each of the features that are central to the paradigm and also how they interpret it. Now, what are they? Uh, first and foremost is the assumption that international relations is different from domestic politics. It's different because there is no Leviathan. There is no authority that has the ability to impose law and order. Individual states must look after their own security and, of course, often do so by joining with others. Domestic politics, in the view of uh, realists, is characterized by the presence of a Leviathan. Secondly, realists emphasize power. Hans Morgenthau described power as the currency not only of international relations, but of politics more generally. Realists also emphasize power because of their view of international relations as lacking a leviathan. Because of this, it becomes more essential to look after your own security. Some would say that security becomes the first concern of the state. And in the kind of environment in which states live, realists argue, they of necessity must ultimately rely on power and force to protect themselves. A third assumption made by realists, again about the world, is that it is largely unchanging. Uh, Hans Morgenthau, again, uh, opened his famous 1948 Politics Among Nations uh, with an argument that international politics was fundamentally the same at the mid-century point as it had been in the 19th, the 18th century, ancient Greece, India, and China. The same principles apply. Realists 
tend to make another assumption, and this one about the study of international relations rather than its substance. And that is that it should be best studied at what is called the system level. And here, let me pause for a moment and offer you uh, an account of levels of analysis. This is a term <coughs> that um, was coined by J. David Singer in the 1960s. It's become uh, widely used even by those uh, like me who do not follow in any way uh, Singer's uh, research program. The international system level refers to interaction among political units, today largely states, uh, and of course it includes non-state actors. The state level pertains to the actors themselves and their characteristics. And some would say, for example, that democratic states behave differently than non-democratic states. There's Many of you know the Democratic Peace Program is based on this assumption. And others, Hans Morgenthal among them, distinguished between what he described as status quo states, uh, states whose leaders were largely satisfied with uh, existing arrangements and sought to defend them, and leaders and states who were committed for whatever reason to the overthrow of the existing order. And he thought that distinction was uh, all critical to how international relations developed. Then we have the sub-state level, which refers to the internal workings of states. So you may have a leader who wants to balance with others against a perceived aggressive state but may be prevented from doing so by domestic public opinion. So in the 1930s and 1940, President Franklin Roosevelt in the United States was greatly restrained by isolationist public opinion into how far he could support uh, Britain or oppose uh, Hitler before World War II uh, began. And finally, we have the leadership level. And the leadership level uh, works on the assumption that leaders matter, that different leaders behave differently even in the same circumstances. Um, I would argue, for example, that uh, had uh, Al Gore won the presidency instead of George Bush, and it was, as you know, extremely close, that the United States would not have gone to war in Iraq. And in the absence of the Anglo-American invasion of Iraq, Middle East politics, maybe even international relations politics in the first decade or two of the 20th, 21st century, would have been very different. We'll use these concepts or these different levels of analysis in the course of our, of our talks. But today I want to make the point that uh, realists believe that the most important level of analysis is the systems level. Now, these are the four assumptions of traditional realism. Some degree of difference between international and domestic relations, the emphasis on power, which in part follows from this difference, the belief that politics, international relations is unchanging, that there really is no such thing as, as progress, and uh, fourth, a analytical assumption that the systems level is the appropriate or most appropriate place to study international relations. Now, within the realist paradigm, there's considerable difference uh, about this. 
each of these uh, assumptions is valued more or less by different realist theorists. And let's just examine some of, of these differences. The first is the difference between domestic and international politics. Uh, one of the most uh, extreme formulations of this is Kenneth Waltz and his theory of international politics where he uses the term anarchy to describe international relations. It's the total absence of any authority. It's a Hobbesian world. States are autonomous, egoistic actors. And it follows from this, in Waltz's view, that it's a self-help system, that military power is all important, that war is an inescapable feature of international relations. Contrast him, and I think I'll use these two for my talk for purposes of comparison, with Hans Morgenthau. And Hans Morgenthau believed that there was enormous variation in international society that at times, as in the 18th century, that it was remarkably robust, that it constituted a society that member states and their leaders were committed to the preservation of the society and its members, that they therefore exercised a certain degree of self-restraint, and that the balance of power was recognized by them as a means of regulating their relations. By contrast, Morgenthau argued that in the late 19th century and certainly in the 20th century and most dramatically during the Cold War, that this had all changed. That there were no common values, practices, norms and institutions that held society together and certainly the leaders of states and their diplomats were not intermarried the way they had been in the 18th and even 19th century. So it was a more anarchic situation and in his view this was a reason why the balance of power failed to function. And ironically, uh, from a Morgenthau perspective, the balance of power was least likely to work when it was most needed. Uh, if we come now to uh, the second characteristic of realism, which is the emphasis on power, here too there are differences. Uh, I noted in a previous uh, discussion that Morgenthau and Waltz uh, both uh, offered ten different criteria for power ranging from the size of the state, its population, the educational level of the state, the wealth of the state, the extent of its uh, military, the skill of its uh, diplomats, uh, the relationship it has with other powers, its particular geophysical setting, all of these things are important. But power itself I've suggested is entirely a subjective formulation because it doesn't refer to much that's real. And even when it refers to real things like, I don't know, tanks or planes, they in themselves are only raw indicators. They tell you nothing about military effectiveness which is the purpose of having military power. For a theorist like Waltz, who aspires to a positivist, parsimonious theory of international relations, power is critical because it's something he believes that can be measured. Uh, it's something that's uh, independent of the conditions in which it's used, um, in his view. And it allows uh, one to make simple statements of international relations by calculating the power of states and hence the polarity of the international system. 
Uh, Hans Wonneke offered a far more nuanced uh, understanding. In his view, uh, power was based uh, in part on material capabilities. They were constitutional components of power. But material capabilities, which Waltz takes, equates with power, for Morgenthau were only one component. Uh, there was the quality of leadership, uh, there was the uh, ethical standing of states uh, that allowed them to uh, be able to influence others and to get them to do what they wanted. So material capabilities were only one component of power and power was only one source of influence. And here, uh, and I have some props today again I want to use, uh, let me compare Morgenthau's understanding to the children's game of rock, scissors, and paper, which I'm sure most of you know. And let me pick up my props. So, in this game, we have paper, we have scissors, and we have a rock. The game illustrates intransitivity. Rationalists assume that actors have transitive preferences. If they value A over B and B over C, then they'll value A over C. If they have more power, if A has power over B, and B has power over C, then A will have power over C. Rocks and scissors suggest that this kind of relationship may be intransitive. So we all know that a rock, right, can break the scissors. And the scissors, in turn, can cut the paper. But, and here's where it becomes intransitive, the paper can wrap the rock. And I remember as a kid playing this game, you hold one behind your back, you take it out, and you see whose rock, scissors, or paper does what against what the other person has taken out from behind his back. And the point here is that political influence, both domestically and internationally, is intransitive. Uh, you may have the ability to dictate to another state what it might do uh, for a variety of reasons. Uh, but you may fail to do so against another state. And to follow up the game, A may be able to influence B, B may be able to influence C on this particular issue, but A can't influence C, and maybe C has more influence over A. And influence depends on not only the quality of leadership, its ability to represent uh, its position, the ability to make arguments, to convince others that what you want them to do is in the common interest. Uh, it also relies upon long-standing relations between states. They may be friendly or hostile, which will determine the degree of influence. Domestic politics is all important. There are a number of factors uh, that come together. So context is important. And for somebody like Morgenthau, material capabilities, as I noted, are only one source of power. Power is only one source of influence. And it's influence that matters. So this is a very big difference within the realist community. Then we come to the question of progress. Uh, Morgenthau changed his view in the course of his life. Uh, he came around to thinking at first that while international relations was always war prone, that in certain periods where society was robust, even if wars were frequent, they were limited. By contrast, in the epochs of the two world wars and the Cold War, in the absence of any robust 
regional or international society. These wars could be uh, a outrance, uh, fought to the finish, highly destructive, destructive of the political systems and the society. Toward the end of his life, uh, he came to recognize the remarkable progress made by the European project and came to hope that society might be in the process of being restored, that at least within certain regions would make war far less likely and transform the nation the relationship between states. Power would still be important, but it would no longer be exercised by force at least within members of the community. And finally, we come to the question of the level of analysis. Uh, for Morgenthau, the systems level was the starting place, and it was the basis of his balance of power theory, well, that status quo units, states, would uh, balance against states that were perceived to threaten the balance of power. Uh, but uh, Morgenthau believed to the extent to which that happened and the extent to which it was successful would depend very much on the states themselves, the quality of their leaders, and the degree of freedom they had from institutional and domestic political constraints to act in terms of the national interest as they understood it. So every level of analysis contributed. The systems level approach was merely an ideal type. When you actually looked at what happened, you had to take into account the context in terms of these other levels of analysis to see what an effect would happen. In his mind, it explained why the balance of power uh, didn't work in the 1930s. It explained why it did work prior to World War I, but also brought about war. And the same with polarity. Kenneth Waltz made definitive statements about polarity, that bipolarity was more stable and peace-prone than multipolarity. Morgenthau, by contrast, argued that bipolarity had the potential to maintain peace between the Soviet Union and the United States, but it could also be the cause of a catastrophic war. Here were two armed giants facing one another, each afraid the other would strike first. The outcome would depend, in his view, on the moral quality of leadership. So ultimately, the individual level of analysis would be determined. Now, my closing remarks here, I want to return to the theme that has been so central to my talks, the difference between positivism and interpretivism. Uh, Kenneth Waltz aspires to make a positivistic, realist theory of international relations. Uh, so do many scholars who are realists who do quantitative uh, research. They work within the positivist tradition. Someone like Hans Morgenthau or John Hertz or me could be described as people who do realism but from an interpretivist position. In my next talk, I'm going to uh, elaborate more on interpretivist realism and particularly on classical realism. Thank you very much.